good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your Acosti Pharma Fiscal Year 2020 Business Update Conference Call. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions and comments following the presentation. If you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero to reach a live operator. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Alexandra Bodie, Investor Relations. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Acosti Pharma's fourth quarter and year-end fiscal 2020 conference call. On the call with us today are Jan Delvis, President and CEO, Pierre Lemieux, Chief Operating Officer, Chief Scientific Officer, and co-founder, Brian Grosh, Chief Commercial Officer, and John Francois Boyley, Vice President Finance. If you have any questions after the call or would like any additional information about the company, please contact Crescendo Communications at 212-671-1020. I'd also like to remind everyone that statements on this conference call that are not statements of historical or current fact constitute forward-looking information. Within the meeting of Canadian securities laws, forward-looking statements with, and within forward-looking statements within the meaning of U.S. federal security laws. Such forward-looking statements involve known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other unknown factors that could cause the actual results of a costy to be materially different from historical results or from any future results expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. In addition to statements which explicitly describe such risks and uncertainties, readers are urged to consider statements labeled with the terms belief, belief, expect, intend, anticipate, potential, should, may, will, plans, continue, or other similar expressions to be uncertain and forward-looking. Listeners are cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements, which speak only as of the date of this conference call. Forward-looking statements in this conference call include, but, not, but are not limited to, information or statements about Acosti's strategy, future operations, prospects in the plans of management, Acosti's ability to conduct all required clinical and non-clinical trials for Caprice, including the timing of end results of those trials. Capri's potential to become the best-in-class cardiovascular drug for treating severe hypertriglyceridemia, Acosti's ability to commercially launch Capri and to fund its continued operations, the timing and outcome of the unblinding of Trilogy 2, Acosti's ability to report top-line results for Trilogy 2 within the contemplated timing, as well as Acosti's ability to report key secondary and exploratory endpoints from both Trilogy studies within the contemplated timing and Acosti's ability to file an NDNA based on the trilogy studies. The forward-looking statements contained in this conference call are expressly qualified in their entirety by this cautionary statement. The special note regarding forward-looking statements section contained in Acosti's latest annual report on Form 10-K and most recent management discussion and analysis, which will be filed, which will be available on CEDAR at www.cedar.com on EDGAR at www.sec.gov, and on the investor section of Acosti's website at www.acostipharma.com. All forward-looking statements in this conference call are made as the date of this conference call. Acosti does not un undertake to update any such forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise, except as required by law. The forward-looking statements contained herein are also subject generally to assumptions and risks and uncertainties that are described from time to time in Acosti's public securities filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Canadian Securities Commissions, including Acosti's latest annual report on Form 10-K and most recent MDNA. I'd now like to turn the call over to Jan Delvies. Please go ahead, Jan. Thank you very much, Allie, and I want to welcome everyone participating on the call today. Our primary focus for this call will be to share the results of our post hoc data analyses and audit findings for Trilogy 1, as well as our plans going forward to unblind Trilogy 2. Now that we've received feedback from the FDA, it's really a pleasure to finally be able to share our Trilogy 1 findings and data with you. Jean-Francois will also briefly review our Q4 and fiscal year-end results. Now, as reported in our press release this morning, we have identified a phenomenon in the Trilogy 1 data that we refer to as pre-randomization triglyceride normalization. Specifically, this phenomenon occurred during the qualification period of the study, that is, between the last screening visit, or visit 1, and the pre-randomization visit, or visit 4, 
which was just prior to patients starting on drug or placebo. So while our initial top-line results from Trilogy 1 were disappointing due to the unusually large and unprecedented placebo effect, we now have a much better understanding of this pre-randomization triglyceride norm normalization phenomenon that we believe contributed significantly to the Trilogy 1 outcome. We appreciated your patience as we worked through our way through this investigation over the last several months, and we're pleased to finally be able to share our findings with you now. As previously disclosed at the end of April, we provided all of the background information on Trilogy 1 and the accompanying data to the FDA, and we recently received their response. As you may have seen in our June 19th press release, and as stated in the current statistical analysis plan for Trilogy 1, the FDA confirmed that they will still require that pivotal or primary endpoint efficacy analyses for Trilogy 2 be performed on the full intent to treat population. That is, inclusive of every patient who was randomized, regardless of whether or not he or she actually complied and took the drug or placebo, or whether they actually um, even completed the trial. It's also important to note that the FDA supported our conduct of additional post hoc analyses on the Trilogy 1 data for exploratory purposes. We're carefully considering the FDA's comments on the Trilogy 1 data, and we will continue to conduct further post hoc analyses based on their feedback. We are also now working to finalize the statistical analysis plan for Trilogy 2, which we plan to submit to the FDA by the end of July. And as noted in our public disclosures, we continue to re remain blinded to the Trilogy 2 data and believe that we will be ready to unblind and report top-line data by the end of August. We also expect to report key secondary and exploratory endpoints from both Trilogy 1 and Trilogy 2 sometime after the unblinding of the Trilogy 2 top-line results. Now, based on our analyses and the review of all of the data thus far, we remain optimistic that we may still have a viable path forward to file an NDA if Trilogy 2 successfully meets its primary endpoint and we can get a significant p-value after combining the results from the intent to treat populations for both of our trials. With that said, I'd like to now share a bit more information about the interesting journey that we've been on since reporting our top line results back in January and I'd like to provide you with a brief summary and explanation of our Trilogy 1 findings. Now, when we reported our top-line Trilogy 1 results, we indicated that we had achieved a 30.5% median reduction in triglyceride levels among all patients receiving Capri at 12 weeks, and a 42.2% median reduction in triglyceride levels in a subset of patients receiving Capri while on background statin therapy at, also at 12 weeks. Additionally, we reported a 36.7% median, median reduction in triglyceride levels among all patients receiving Capri at 26 weeks. Despite the positive results in the Capri arm due to an unusually large placebo response that resulted in median reductions in triglyceride levels of 27.5% and 28% at 12 and 26 weeks respectively, Trilogy 1 did not re uh, reach statistical significance. And as we stated previously, the observed reductions in triglyceride levels in the placebo group were far greater than anything seen in previous prescription omega-3 trials in hypertriglyceridemia. In fact, they were at least two to three times greater than what would have been expected. Not only were we caught by surprise, but our expert clinical advisors, key investigators, and other partners in the trial were all equally confounded by these seemingly inexplicable results. So the obvious question was why? Why were placebo results so strong in Trilogy 1, and what could have caused this outcome? We immediately ruled out any misallocation of treatment or a mix-up of Capri and placebo capsules, as well as uh, any implication that the placebo that was actually used in the Trilogy studies, which is simple cornstarch, could have been the cause. Cornstarch is generally regarded as safe and is a commonly used placebo in the pharmaceutical industry. It's well known to be an inert and inactive excipient with low nutritional value. Now, the protocol for Trilogy 1 and 2 had input from and was approved by the FDA and followed essentially the same standard design as had been used by all other companies who had previously run trials in severe hypertriglyceridemia. The eligibility criteria 
and the design of the screening and qualification phases of the study were written to ensure comparability with these pr uh, prior trials and to minimize differences. Having said that, there, there actually were um, a few slight differences in the Trilogy 1 patient population as compared to previous studies. For example, we had a slightly higher percentage of diabetics and patients on statins. And also, as required by the FDA, we included patients who were stabilized on fibrates. But all of our post hoc analyses confirmed that these differences did not contribute to the significant placebo effect. We thoroughly investigated the effect of various other categorical, de categorical demographic and baseline characteristics, such as alcohol use, race, diabetes, uh, concomitant use of diabetic med medications and or statins. Uh, we looked at all of these things uh, and the effect on triglyceride normalization in an attempt to further identify or eliminate possible contributors to this phenomenon. Specifically, various factors were compared between treatment arms, such as washout or discontinuation of lipid-lowering medications at screening, use of lipid-lowering medications at randomization, and subsequent change in these medications during the study, use of anti-diabetic medications at randomization, and any subsequent changes in those meds during the study. Bottom line, we did not find any imbalance in any case between the treatment groups that was likely to explain the unusually large placebo effect seen in Trilogy 1. So that left us with two possible hypotheses for further investigation. First, something else related to how the patients were screened and qualified for the study or how the trial was conducted may have contributed to this unusually high placebo response. Or second, and this outcome, or the second possibility was that this outcome was simply due to chance or what is referred to as regression to the mean. However, because of the magnitude of the placebo response, we felt that chance was unlikely to be at least the sole contributor to this phenomenon. Routine monitoring activities were conducted throughout the Trilogy 1 trial by our CRO and by us to ensure adherence to the protocol and to detect potential protocol violations. However, as previously reported, as we began to analyze the data, we identified some unexpected and in inconsistent findings that we suspected may have contributed to this unusual placebo effect. Given these observations, we then focused our efforts on a comprehensive and rigorous post hoc review of the data and in parallel the conduct of thorough independent audits of patient data and records at the five clinical sites who had been among the highest enrollers and who had also experienced the largest placebo responses. Some of the best experts in the field were intrigued by our data and graciously offered their help, including, of course, our principal investigator, Dr. Darush Mazafarian. These experts provided us with their thoughts, ideas, and guidance as our investigations moved forward and as we ultimately compiled all of the data into our briefing package for the FDA. And as you hopefully saw in our press release today, the post hoc analysis of the Trilogy 1 data revealed a rapid, significant, and sustained reduction in triglyceride levels at the two visits during the patient qualification period, which took place between the last screening visit, or visit 1, and the time of the patient's uh, randomization at visit 4, which we also refer to as week 0. Very importantly, a significant percentage of the patients had triglyceride levels that went up dramatically during this qualification period and then dropped significantly prior to being put on drug or placebo. We're referring to this phenomenon as pre-randomization triglyceride normalization. And Acosti believes that it may have contributed to an artifactual overestimation of triglyceride reduction and consequently a significant underestimation of the post-randomization treatment effect of Capri. It's also very important to note that this pre-randomization triglyceride normalization effect was much greater in the placebo group as compared to the Capri treatment group further compromising the ability of the study to detect a clinically significant drug treatment effect. As a result, our post hoc analyses indicated that this phenomenon was a major contributor to the unusually large placebo effect that we saw in Trilogy 1. 
Now, we've not found a single root cause that explains this normalization phenomenon. We have several theories as to what may have caused this, but unfortunately there's no way to corroborate our hypotheses based on the data and the audit findings. The most likely possibility is that the affected patients in the trial may not have been adequately fasted during the qualification visits. In spite of those patients claiming to the clinical site administrators that they had been fully fasted. This could have artificially elevated their triglyceride levels during the qualification phase, which would have increased the average of the three triglyceride values used to calculate their baseline value, and thereby allowing them to be accepted into the trial. It's important to keep in mind that triglycerides can be highly variable and significantly affected by fat in the diet. This is why it's important that a patient is fully fasted when they get their blood drawn for triglyceride analysis. For example, we know that following a meal, triglycerides will dramatically increase up two to two and a half times. They tend to peak after four hours and then go back to baseline only after more than nine hours of fasting. For this reason, we believe factors such as misreporting or underreporting of the patient's fasted condition may have contributed to this normalization effect. Again, we cannot prove this at this time, but it still remains our primary working hypothesis. Now, based on the National Cholesterol Education Program Working Group on lipoprotein measurement, fasting triglyceride levels of healthy individuals can typically vary by about 10% or so within a one to two week time period. And that variation tends to be random, going in either direction, up and down. However, this variation can be a bit greater in certain physiological and disease states, and we know, for example, that subjects with very high triglycerides, as was the case in Trilogy 1, may be somewhat more susceptible to experiencing wider week-to-week -week fluctuations. However, the extent and magnitude of the triglyceride variation seen in Trilogy 1 was much larger than the expected 10%. And what tipped us off that something else was going on was that the variation only went in one direction. It only went down, and the reduction was quite significant. The overall pre-randomization reduction in triglycerides across all subjects in Trilogy 1 was 20%. And very importantly, a full one quarter of all subjects experienced a triglyceride reduction equal to or greater than 38%. And remember, this is before they were randomized on drug or placebo. Finally, the median triglyceride normalization reached 30% or more in 12 of the highest enrolling sites. Therefore, we believe that this pre-randomization triglyceride normalization effect was not likely due only to the typical individual day-to-day -day triglyceride variation. And again, while we're hypothesizing that additional factors such as misreporting or underreporting of the patient's fasted state may have contributed to this normalization phenomenon in Trilogy 1, the audits of the affected patient's information and data were not able to confirm this. And I'd like to add, again, that while fasted glucose levels could have potentially provided some additional information regarding patient compliance during the qualification phase of the study, it was not required by the protocol for the reason that, as I mentioned earlier, its use is unreliable in metabolically impaired subjects, such as those with type 2 diabetes, or those with metabolic syndrome as they tend to have much higher levels of glucose as compared to normal individuals. So uh, keep in mind that about 50% of the patients in Trilogy 1 had diabetes. Now I want to mention that the other major finding that came out of our post hoc analysis was that about 40% of all randomized and eligible subjects had triglyceride levels at randomization, again defined as visit four or week zero, and before they started on drug or placebo, that were outside of the protocol specified average qualification thresholds for patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, and again, those limits are uh, uh, greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter and less than 1,500 milligrams per deciliter. So it had become quite clear to us that the extent and magnitude of pre-randomization triglyceride norm normalization had a substantial impact on the ability of Trilogy 1 to accurately determine the therapeutic effect of Capri on the primary endpoint in true patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia. 
Now, let me take a moment to further explain the actual impact of this normalization effect on our results. As per our statistical analysis plan for Trilogy 1, and I should add consistent with previous studies conducted in patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia, we used an average of three triglyceride values for the calculation of the baseline, corresponding to time points during the two qualification measurements at week minus one and week minus two, and again at week zero, which is the visit just prior to randomization. So once we recognize the significant effect that this artifactual pre-randomization reduction of triglycerides had on the study outcome, we conducted a new post hoc analysis using a revised single point triglyceride baseline value collected just at week zero, just prior to when the patient was randomized and started on drug or placebo. We now refer to this as week zero, uh, th this week zero triglyceride level as the revised baseline. Only those subjects meeting the protocol specified triglyceride thresholds of having triglyceride levels greater than 500 but less than 1,500 milligrams per deciliter at week zero were included in this post hoc analysis. This revised approach corrected for a significant amount of the artifactual pre randomization triglyceride reduction that was seen in the subjects that were most affected by the large placebo effect. After these patients were, were removed, a total of 42 out of the 69 subjects remained in the placebo group, and 101 out of the 173 subjects remained in the Capri group, and were included in the post hoc analyses representing 61% and 58% of all randomized subjects, respectively. Not surprisingly, the significantly smaller sample size resulted in reduced power to detect a treatment difference of 20% as specified in the statistical analysis plan and as compared to the plan sample sizes in the original analysis plan. Nevertheless, the results do suggest clinical relevance, even if statistical significance was, was not demonstrated. Furthermore, based on the post hoc trends implied by these summarized results, it is plausible that a larger number of patients, such as those in Trilogy 2, could enable us to achieve statistical significance. Upon removing subjects with triglyceride levels below 500 and above 1,500 milligrams per deciliter at week zero, subjects receiving Capri showed a 28.1% median reduction in triglycerides, compared to a 15.4% median reduction among subjects receiving placebo, for an unadjusted difference of 12.7% after 12 weeks and a p-value of 0.29. Compared to the original analysis, the revised baseline reduced the placebo response by approximately 12 percentage points from a minus 27.5% to a minus 15.4%. This actually represented a 44% reduction in the placebo response, while the response in the Capri arm remained mostly unaffected and was reduced only slightly from a minus 30% uh, versus a minus 28.1%, so that was only about a 6% difference. After 26 weeks of double-blind treatment, the efficacy of Capri showed good persistency of effect with a 32.6% median reduction of triglycerides compared with a 14.6% median reduction in the placebo group, reaching an unadjusted difference of a minus 18% which trended towards statistical significance with a p-value of 0.08. Compared to the original analysis, the revised baseline reduced the placebo response at 26 weeks by approximately 13 percentage points, from minus 28% to a minus 14.6%, so roughly a 46% reduction, while the response in the Capri arm remained mostly unaffected reduced from a minus 36.7% to a minus 32.6%, or roughly a 10% reduction. As important sub, an important subgroup of patients are those with triglyceride levels above 750 milligrams per deciliter. We know from the previous hypertriglyceridemia studies that the higher the baseline triglyceride value, typically the greater the reduction that is seen when these patients are treated with the therapeutic omega-3. Interestingly, that was not the case with the original top-line analysis of Trilogy 1 reported back in January. 
we were troubled by the fact that this subgroup of sicker patients actually seemed to show a smaller reduction in the Capri group than those who had baseline triglyceride levels um, much lower between 500 and 750 milligrams per deciliter. When we conducted the subgroup analysis on these patients with triglyceride levels above 750, using the revised baseline at visit four or week zero, it corrected this discrepancy from the original top line analysis. These patients represented 41% of the subjects retained in the post hoc analyses. And within this group, the median triglyceride reduction in the subjects receiving Capri increased as would be expected, reaching a minus 36.3% at week 12 and a minus 43% at week 26. In comparison, the median triglyceride reduction for the placebo group was a minus 11.8% at week 12 and a minus 14.4% at week 26, resulting in unadjusted differences of a minus 24.5% and a minus 28.6% respectively in favor of Capri, with p-values of 0.22 and 0.15 respectively. So you can see that the post hoc analyses of Trilogy 1 data using a revised single point baseline showed a meaningful trend towards correcting for the unexpectedly large placebo response observed in the original analysis and allowed for a clearer understanding of the impact on the triglyceride primary endpoint and the potential therapeutic effect of Capri over the full 26 weeks of treatment. Overall, these results based on the revised baseline indicate a trend towards improved efficacy of Capri to reduce triglycerides as compared to placebo. However, as discussed, the median difference in triglyceride levels between Capri and placebo from the Trilogy 1 post hoc analyses still fell short of reaching statistical significance at week 12, uh, which is the primary endpoint, due to the reduced number of patients and the resulting reduced statistical power of the analysis. For this reason, and based on the results of our phase two data, we're moving quickly now to uh, unblind the Trilogy 2 results. We eagerly anticipate the outcome of those top line results and the important secondary and exploratory endpoints that will follow shortly thereafter. While the triglyceride reduction achieved by Capri based on the revised baseline analysis compares favorably to that of other omega-3 therapies most recently studied in pivotal phase three trials in severe hypertriglyceridemia, uh, these data will remain as post hoc analyses, and for now at least the FDA considers them to be exploratory. Therefore, we do not believe that we, we will be able to use the study purely on the basis of these post hoc analyses. However, we do believe that they can be used to show a trend towards a positive treatment effect in favor of Capri. Furthermore, if Trilogy 2 can achieve a positive p-value, and if the pooled integrated efficacy results with Trilogy 1 using the intent to treat population are also favorable, we plan to discuss with the FDA whether they would accept this data in support of an NDA. We would plan to discuss this with them at, at our pre-NDA meeting uh, later this year. Now, consistent with the company's prior disclosures, it's important to keep in mind that the FDA may still require us to conduct another confirmatory phase three trial in severe hypertriglyceridemia patients to support the filing of, of an NDA, in which case it's possible that the design, the sample size, and the duration of such a third trial could be different from the previous two trilogy studies. Finally, I'm sure you're wondering what the odds are that Trilogy 2 will be affected by the same pre-randomization triglyceride normalization effect that we saw in Trilogy 1. It's honestly hard for us to say as we remain blinded to the Trilogy 2 data and therefore we have no idea if the same phenomenon also occurred. Having said that, however, there's a chance that we could see some degree of this same placebo effect in Trilogy 2 However, we believe that if we do see it, it could potentially be to a lesser degree, and here's why. We know that the contribution from the five highest enrolling sites is much lower in Trilogy 2, as they contributed only 12% of the patients in Trilogy 2 versus 36% of the patients in Trilogy 1. And we had more sites randomizing fewer subjects in Trilogy 2 as compared to Trilogy 1. We also saw more uniform enrollment across all of the sites in Trilogy 2. In other words, we had fewer of these high enrolling sites. So the odds are that any given site would have less influence on the overall outcome of the Trilogy 2 trial. 
Also in the event that localized practices may have contributed in some way to the pre-randomization triglyceride normaliza normalization phenomenon, then we would expect this effect to be much more diluted in Trilogy 2 as well. Furthermore, while the studies share the same design, they were conducted in different geographies, although a few of the same sites in the U.S. did randomize subjects in both studies. Specifically, as I mentioned before, only 12 sites that randomized subjects in Trilogy 1 also randomized subjects in Trilogy 2. And keep in mind there was a total of 71 sites in Trilogy 2. These 12 sites accounted for 62% of all randomized subjects in Trilogy 1, but only 19% of the patients in Trilogy 2. And again, while all of the five highest enrolling sites in Trilogy 1 also enrolled patients in Trilogy 2, they contributed to only about 12% of the total patients. So for these reasons, we believe the two studies can be regarded as being completely independent from each other. So with that, I'd like to now turn it over to Jean-Francois Bolli, our VP of Finance, to present our Q4 and year-end results. Uh, Jean-Francois? Yes, thank you, Jan. Before I begin, I'd like to point out that our consolidated financial statements have been prepared in accordance to U.S. GAAPs as opposed to IFRS in the past, as we have reported in the past. We are also now reporting our results in U.S. dollars versus Canadian dollars. So turning to our results for the quarter, R&D expenses before depreciation, amortization, and stock-based compensation expenses were $13.2 million for the year ended March 31st, 2020, compared to 26.9 million for the year ended March 31st, 2019. The 13.6 million decrease was mainly attributable to a 14.4 million decrease in research contracts, partially offset by an increase in salary and benefit due to increased headcount and related benefits. This lower research contract expense is primarily attributed to the phase three clinical trial program getting closer to completion. Our general and admin administrative expenses, again before stock-based compensation expenses, were 4.6 million for the year ended March 31st, 2020, an increase of 1.3 million from 3.3 million for the year ended March 31st, 2019. This increase was mainly attributable to $450,000 increase associated with the company's insurance policies, as well as an increase of $830,000 in corporate accounting and legal fees associated with the impl implementation of our new ERP system and the conversion of our financial reporting from IFRS to U.S. GAAPs. Our loss from operation, again, for the year ended March 31, 2020, was $24.4 million compared to a loss from operation of $34.4 million for the year ended March 31, 2019. The decrease was due mainly to a reduction in research contract expenses as the Phase three clinical program for Capri is getting closer to completion. Our net loss for the year ended March 31, 2020 was $25.5 million, or $0.30 cent per share compared to a net loss of $39.4 million, or $0.73 cent per share for the year ended March 31, 2019. The decreased net loss is primarily due to the reduction of the research development expenses, again as the Phase three clinical program for Capri was getting closer to completion, lower net financial expenses, and to the change in fair value of our Warren deri derivative liability. Now, turning to cash and cash equivalent and our short-term investments, they total $14.2 million as of March 31, 2020, compared to $25.8 million for the year ended March 31, 2019. We believe that existing cash will fully fund the company's operation into the first quarter of 2021, the first calendar quarter, quarter of 2021. Now, in addition to our annual filing to be filed this afternoon, we will also file a shelf registration statement with an expanded at-the-market facility. As many of you are aware, we have had an ATM facility in place for some time, 
and have been very careful and prudent in our use of the ATM. Now that we have become a U.S. filer, we were required to convert our existing S3 and file a new S3 with the corresponding ATM in order to keep this program in place. Keep in mind that when we convert our, when we convert our S3, it will start a new three-year clock so that, so that is the reason that we will take the opportunity to increase the size of the facility to 200 million. Generally speaking, ATMs provide an, attr an attractive and flexible alternative and lower cost of capital compared to traditional financings, which often come with big discounts and warrants. I'd like now to turn it back to you, Jan. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Jean-Francois. Uh, so to wrap up our uh, prepared remarks, we made steady progress throughout fiscal 2020. Although we were disappointed by the outcome of Trilogy 1, we now have a better understanding of what contributed to the unprecedented placebo effect. And we remain cautiously optimistic about the outlook for Trilogy 2. We're now carefully considering the FDA's comments on Trilogy 1 and will consider or, or continue to conduct further post hoc analyses based on their feedback. We're working to finalize the statistical analysis plan for Trilogy 2, which we plan to submit to the FDA by the end of July, and we currently expect to report top-line data by the end of August 2020. We also plan to report the key secondary and exploratory endpoints from both Trilogy 1 and Trilogy 2 trials as soon as possible after the unblinding of Trilogy 2 results. On one final note, we're not slowing down, and we remain focused on the end goal, which is delivering value for our shareholders. In addition to completing our Phase three trials in fiscal 2020, we also began important pre-commercialization activities, including advanced planning for the scale-up of our manufacturing, preparation of our NDA, as well as advancing partnering and other market development objectives. We're also pleased to have been awarded additional composition of matter and method of use patents in Canada, United States, Mexico, China, Hong Kong, Chile, and Israel since the start of fiscal 2020 alone. These are very important and valuable patents and add to the growing portfolio of intellectual property for Capri. Overall, we continue to believe in Capri, and despite the recent bumps in the road, we're committed to doing everything in our power to seeing this through and achieving a successful outcome. With that, uh, operator, we can now open the call to any questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions. If you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. If you're using a speakerphone, we ask that while posing your question, you pick up your handset to provide the best sound quality. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question or comment, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. We'll take our first question today from Leland Gershon with Oppenheimer. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, good afternoon, Jan. Thank you um, for that uh, very comprehensive update on what sounds like a very thorough analysis. Um, a few questions for me. Just to, to clarify, so, so would you be able to analyze Trilogy 2 using a week zero baseline single point or because of the FDA's commentary about using the prior SAP, would you not be able to, you, to analyze Trilogy 2 according to the single point baseline and therefore have to use the, um, the three measurements between uh, screening and randomization? Yeah, so um, what the FDA uh, clarified is that we could not eliminate patients. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we have to uh, do the analysis with the full int intent to treat population. Um, we do have some flexibility around the analysis. However, uh, we, we likely will not be able to use a single point endpoint. However, having said that, I think the FDA has allowed us to use the um, single point baseline uh, as, as a further, you know, in further post hoc analyses. Okay, and would you be able to when you when you analyzed um, post hoc the trilogy one data to get the um, uh, patients at week zero who fit you know between the 500 and the 1500, obviously a 40 percent reduction in the number. Would you be able to tell us what the numeric mean baseline at week zero was for the placebo and drug groups 
and what they were at the end of the study? Thanks. Uh, I, I don't have that information in my head, but Pierre, do you, do you by chance have that information? Well, there was a, uh, I mean, the baseline value, as you can imagine, losing uh, five, uh, you know, almost 40% of the, the population when we decided to, uh, you know, to remove, to use only one baseline. So, uh, obviously, the baseline value went from, uh, uh, you know, it was around 670 uh, milligrams per deciliter, and it went down to, you know, 550. So, there was a, a major decrease of the baseline in overall. So. Um, and that, which is not helping, by the way, to, to show a, a stronger efficacy. And, and for the rest of uh, all the way to the week 12 and 26, I, I, I cannot tell you right now. I don't have the numbers in front of me to be precise. But there was a significant uh, baseline, um, you know, by removing these, uh, these patients that were you know, only using the, uh, the baseline at week zero. Okay, thanks. And, and should we expect when you do report the Trilogy 2 data, even though you are using the ITT analysis, that you will also potentially, if indicated, report the week zero only baseline analysis similar to what you did with Trilogy 1? Gary, you want to yeah. take that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be planning to publish these information, of course, uh, because, you know, we, there, there's a story to be told. And, uh, and both analyses should be carried in, in parallel. So uh, for, for regulatory purposes, of course, you know, the primary endpoint was to use the three values as a baseline. But the fact that we've, uh, you know, that we've conducted post-hoc analyses, it makes a lot of sense for us to tell the world how, you know, how it behaves and uh, what happens and, and how this placebo uh, effect is impacting the results. Because at the end of the day, the question remains, you know, uh, does Capri work or not? And, um, and so, you know, I think... There's a very strong sentiment that when you get rid of this placebo effect and when you eliminate uh, some of the, 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 the patients that were below 500, uh, you know, before, before starting a treatment, that there's, the product is, is telling us something, you know, that there's a, a treatment effect is taking place over time. So that's encouraging. And we need to, um, you know, we need to, um, to, to say that and we need to report this. So with Dr. Mazafer and the PI, is the, you know, uh, we've agreed that we will publish this information. Uh, at some point. Now, uh, we still need to go through the, some of the, the postdoc analyses. Uh, we don't have the complete clinical study report as of yet. It's going to come uh, from our, our CRO. But when, when we have all those uh, two sets of data, uh, we, we will. You know, we will just certainly share that information, which is critical and key for us. Okay. And, and, and thank you. And then my last question relates to kind of the overlap between what, what, what you had discussed previously on previous calls about, you know, the five sites um, that were the higher enrollers, but also may have had irregularities in, in how they'd handled patients in the trial and the um, kind of unprecedented, um, uh, you know, randomization correction that you saw between the screening and the randomization. Is it is it fair to say that there was a fairly tight association between those sites and the degree of this correction over those three visits. Um, just want to be clear on that versus the other sites in Trilogy One and perhaps not having as much of an effect um, observed in these in this correction of the triglyceride at the, at the beginning of the trial. Thanks. Here, do you want to take that? Yeah, the, the, the normalization is, is across all the sites, but uh, obviously those uh, five sites were selected for um, an investigation, as you know, uh, because they were high enrolling. So for us, it was. Um, easy to really focus our attention in those five sites. So definitely those five, sti five sites really demonstrated a, a higher uh, normalization effect, placebo effect. Uh, but overall, when you, uh, you know, the, the easiest thing for us was to say, okay, you know, if we get rid of those five sites, for instance, what would be the outcome? And, and, um, and it's not translating, if you will, into something useful or, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, it's really not helping in the in the outcome of, of the treatment effect of Capri. So it's, and, and that's because we've realized. I think the five sites allowed us really to dig into this story. But when you start analyzing across the board all the sites, you realize that a lot of patients, all of them, in average, are you know, losing at least 18, 20 percent of their triglycerides. So that's, so you know, overall, it would have been a very 
quick and easy way to fix this, but um, it, it, it did not did not did not lead to that that outcome, unfortunately. But for okay. Trilogy Two, if I may, uh, Leland, uh, on Trilogy Two, so John said it in the uh, in what uh, she reported to you just uh, a minute ago. You know, Trilogy Two has uh, less of those sites, less patients uh, from the, coming from those uh, sites. So you know, we we should expect a, a, a much less uh, placebo effect, and and um, you know, in Trilogy Two. So it's hard for to, for us to say still, but you know, I think we're we're um, I think we're in a much better place with Trilogy Two. And and again, keep in mind that this is science. Uh, when we spoke with our experts, uh, sometimes you know we hear words like, uh, "Well, you've you know you've been unlucky. This is by chance." Uh, I, I know it doesn't sound too scientific, but I guess it's part of the uh, of, of you know running phase three trials. <laughs> it's part of the picture, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. I'll come back in the queue. Thanks, Leland. We'll take our next question from Mayank Montami with B. Riley. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question and appreciate the detailed update here. Uh, definitely been a fascinating six months uh, going through this. Uh, just quickly, uh, taking a step back, um, is there, like, w what can the field, like, take away from this? Like, how, like, has there been another study where something like this have, has happened, or how do you think this informs uh, as some of these severe hyperglycidemia trials are, are run? Just, just curious your thoughts on that, and then I have specific questions. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it, it's hard for us to pin down the, you know, what the, the actual cause was. Again, we, we believe that, you know, perhaps many of these patients were not fully fasted, as, you know, as I stated earlier. Um, I think, you know, we, we've, we've discussed this exhaustively in-house. I mean, are there ways that, you know, in the future, in future protocols, you can somehow you know, ensure that the patients were fasted, um, you know, and, and you're relying to a great extent on them, you know, telling you the truth about whether or not they've eaten in the last nine hours, right? Because um, that can most definitely throw off the, the um, triglyceride results. Um, you know, and we, we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you can look at, at uh, doing, you know, uh, glucose, looking at glucose levels, but in these patients that, that have diabetes and, and metabolic syndrome, you know, it's, it, it's not always indicative, you know. I, I mean, I think it's one measure we probably would add in the future. Um, you know, I, I think also, I'll comment on this and let Pierre jump in, but I think to the extent we could have stuck with um, more, uh, I would say, uh, routine clinical sites that are actually treating the patients. Um, these high enroller sites were more of these clinical trial factories, if you will, and you know they, they take people in off the street and they don't have a history with those patients. So there's, there's not that um, connection with the patient. Um, you know, on the flip side, you know, it's it's not easy to find these patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia. So, um, you know, we do believe if if we could have ensured that we had, you know, true uh, severe hypertriglyceridemia patients in the trial, um, it might have reduced this um, this effect to some degree. Pierre, I don't know if you want to add anything. Well, I thank you. You've said it all, John. Um, yeah, I mean. Uh... The differences between our protocols um, and, and, and the, our, our competitors or the previous protocols, I mean, they're, they're, they're very, very small differences. <laughs> and so, you know, to explain this, uh, you know, this difference in placebo, uh, this, this was unprecedented for, for sure. And, uh, and maybe over time, you know, there's uh, also, <clears throat> you know, either better management of those uh, patients or, you know, they're, they're really in demand. So, uh, Again, we couldn't prove it, but we, we could have thought that some of the sites were now geared to redefine those patients and tweak, uh, in a way, some of the ways to make them eligible. But we couldn't prove it. Uh, but maybe over time, you know, there's there's um, a gain of intelligence from those sites in order to find those patients. So, uh, but again, you know, it's not something that we can prove and um, just pure speculation from uh, from our 
from our part. It might be a mixture, uh, a mix of all these things too, you know, a lack of uh, fasting, um, you know, um, the fact that, like Jen said, I think this is, uh, we would have been more, I would say, comfortable knowing that the, all the patients had a medical history of uh, long-term uh, severe hypertrigosuridemia, but, um, but it's not the case, and it was not part of the protocol as well. So, you know, in terms of differences in the, in the future, we might impose uh, and put in the protocol in writing because it was not, and, and, and none of the other protocols uh, as well you know, did not uh, impose on the sites a, a long-term uh, medical, uh, we'd say, dossier on, on, on the, the patient themselves. But, you know, uh, this is something that can be probably added. At the same time, in the future, I mean, in the same time, it would have had a lot of time to these, um, you know, to those trials. So uh, that's also to keep in mind. So the more you're imposing restrictions and exclusion criteria, it, 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 it's um, already that it's difficult to find these patients. If you put a long list of exclusion criteria, it, it becomes, uh, it would have taken us maybe three, four years before we could have completed. So, you know, overall, if I may, I think, you know, we don't think the protocol was wrong or bad or miss, you know, uh, I think it was, you know, according to what was done in the past by others and even improved in some cases. So uh, the fact that we have fibrates in our uh, in our trial as well was, was a, a plus. Um, but overall, you know, this is uh, what I can add on, on what Jen uh, covered. Okay. Thanks for that, and I, and I understand it's a cash when I do. Uh, so two quick specific questions. Um, can you maybe comment on uh, the error bars that you may have seen with the postdoc versus ITT, just trying to understand like uh, the super responder phenomena, if, if there is. And then um, the background fish oil supplements used. Uh, I, I know you said lipid medication in general, but, but just curious if there was any background fish oil supplement used in, in pre-randomization or, or afterwards uh, that, that you noted uh, could, be, could be something worth highlighting. Just curious about that. Yeah. Well, I cut the second question, to be honest. The first one I, I didn't quite understood. But, you know, to, to answer your question, of course, supplements, fish oil, or other concomitant medications, uh, even lifestyle, lifestyle change as well was, was looked at uh, to, you know, to determine whether or not they, this, these uh, elements could have um, disturbed the, uh, you know, the, the, the trial, and, and we didn't find anything. So, honestly, there was no uh, unbalance or anything to be reported order here that that would have changed the outcome of of, of the trial so it's um, it was looked at a uh, good question uh, but you know we couldn't uh, so we, we ruled it out but the, the first question I, I I'm not sure I understood what you were asking. yeah yeah the, you know the error bars of um, uh, when, when you look when you do your mean uh, just kind of the super responders or under responders oh. like just just curious if that was different between ITT versus postdoc analysis uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's a good question. So in our protocol, we had planned for, uh, you know, all the statistical powers based on potential standard deviation, for instance. Uh, in our protocol, it was set at 40%. Uh, and again, it's based on what we've seen in, the, in, in previous trials. And when we did the, uh, the, you know, the original analysis versus the, um, let's say the post hoc analysis, there was not much difference in, in variability. So the standard deviation was not that different. You, you could have expected, because you're only using one value, that you have a lot of variation, you know, on using only one value. And surprisingly, we were, you know, in the same ballpark uh, uh, comparing, you know, the original uh, analysis versus the post hoc analysis. So. Okay, great. And just final one, if you could comment on uh, the, the FDA rec request that you had for a type C meeting, like what what specific outcome you, you were looking for, and 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 as you think about going forward from trilogy two, just kind of highlight um, what, what is the desired outcome from trilogy two that will help you get to that uh, that request that you had for the FDA in type C. Um, you know, I'm not sure I caught the first part of that, Mike. Sorry, the, you said. Could you re could you repeat it? Yeah, sure. So as you as you obviously highlighted uh, when you had the FDA um, meeting uh, request, Type C meeting request, there was 
a uh, number of items you wanted to discuss with them live and, right. and there was a desired outcome uh, from that and and it, it seems like they they responded to you with a written response uh, uh so so i'm just curious what what was your desired like your blue sky scenario there in in that in that meeting and and how you think trilogy 2 uh, could help you get there to that desired outcome okay yeah, if I, so if I understand, you know, and keep in mind that during COVID, the FDA is not conducting meetings. Um, so this was handled. Um, we had to submit questions in writing and all of our background materials, you know, in writing. So we, we sent them an extensive package and a list of questions, and they reviewed the package and provided some answers back. Um, so it's really, you know, uh, based on that, you know, as, as we said, um, that we will um, continue to do some additional actual, you know, post hoc analyses based on the, the FDA's uh, response, and then um, proceed with uh, modifying the um, and finalizing the, the uh, Trilogy 2 statistical analysis plan. Um, which will include, you know, the ability to do some of these post hoc analyses now that we understand what happened in, in Trilogy 1 and submit that to the FDA and then we'll proceed to unblind. And once we unblind Trilogy 2, uh, the plan would then be to uh, pool the data from both trials to see if we could get to a favorable p-value. Um, now, this would be combining the ITT populations from both trials. Um, and so if, if we believe if, if we can get a strong positive p-value uh, with Trilogy 2 and if the pooled you know, uh, efficacy results with Trilogy 1 using the ITT population from Trilogy 1 are also favorable, um, that we would then plan to discuss with the FDA whether they would allow us to use that data to proceed to file an NDA, and again, there's precedence for that, um, you know. You know, and, and I think um, we believe that the, the post hoc analysis has, has definitely shown a strong trend in favor of, of Capri. That's what we were hoping to understand. You know, one, you know, what happened? How do we explain the, this placebo effect? And when you correct for that placebo effect, do you have, you know, resulting um, uh, data that supports the uh, uh, effectiveness of, of Capri. We believe we have that now. So the next step is to unblind Trilogy 2, pull the data, and see if we can get to a positive p-value. And if we do, then I think it's a matter of, of sitting down with the FDA in a uh, pre-NDA meeting, which would be held sometime later this year, and to go through all the data, discuss it with them, and, um, and, and get their uh, guidance on on whether or not we can proceed to file an NDA. I don't know if that answered your question, but that would be yes, the plan. Yes, that's very helpful. Th thank you, Jan. I appreciate it, and look forward to more updates. Thanks. Thanks, Maya. We'll take our next question from Andre Uden with Mackey Research Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, Jan. Hi, Chair. Just uh, hi, Andre. Just a couple questions. Um, in terms of the trilogy post hoc analysis. Uh, how many patients would have needed to, would you have needed to show statistical significance? I don't know that. Pierre, do you have that number in your head? I, I don't actually. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't. We can get back to you, Andre, on this. Okay, sure. Um, and just in terms, I know you sort of answered this before, but in the future, based on that, you don't quite understand what happened in, in the pre-randomization. Um, in a future trial design, uh, would you be able to prevent the same issue if you ran another phase three trial? Yeah. So, so again, as I, th I think you know, uh, Leland kind of touched on on this as well. I think um, you know, and I guess my ink did uh, that. Um, you know, we we probably would want to do fasted blood glucose levels, even though they're not as meaningful in that population. I think we would want to get those levels just to see what they tell us um, and see if there's, you know, significant change, any surprises there, you know, throughout the qualification period. Um, and, and I don't know, Pierre, if you want to comment, I mean, I know you guys have been kicking around some additional things that, you, you know, in terms of um, monitoring that, that you might do. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, as I said to my aunt as well, so the, the, the medical history becomes also very important. I think it gives you more confidence about the uh, eligibility of the patient as well. So that's one thing. Uh, there's also this, um, you know, potential compliance issue that might still, you know, uh, again, we, we couldn't prove that either, but that too would have been easy for us to, to rule out the sites or patients to say, hey, you know what, they didn't take the drug. So. And, and, and we have the data, but I think we could do more, you know, to, to, to monitor, if you will, uh, levels of EPA, DHA. We've done it, uh, but maybe we could do more. And, uh, and, and again, it really, uh, previous trials in other fields, in lipid management, for instance, uh, sometimes some of the trials have failed because the patients were, you know, not taking their drugs. So in our case, it doesn't seem to be... Uh, the issue, but you know, I wouldn't take any chance uh, <laughs> in the future. So that's something we could probably improve. Not that it was an issue here, but I think it it, it could be useful. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Andre. We'll take our next question from Nathan Weinstein with Aegis Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my question, and it's clear you've been literally working on going through Trilogy 1, and thanks for sharing uh, your findings with us. And so my first question uh, relates to the fact that the FDA is going to require the analysis to be, be performed on the full intent to treat. Um, I just was curious whether that uh, was a surprise compared to your expectations going in. No, not at all. Um, you know, we, we honestly expected that. I think we're encouraged by the fact that they allowed us to do the, you know, and will continue to allow us to do these additional post hoc analyses. Um, the other thing I should mention is that we, we again, we don't have the answer yet. Uh, Pierre and, and the statisticians are working on this now, but we're taking a look at modeling um, what kind of results we would need to get in Trilogy 2 um, to be able to get an overall favorable p-value in, in a pooled analysis. Um, so that's, that's an important, um, you know, uh, analysis that's, that's underway right now. So, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, thank you. And so obviously I'll be watching to see uh, what Trilogy 2 looks like, but to sort of take a little weight off of a binary situation, if we think about a scenario where you, but you do kind of have to run another phase three trial. Um, prospectively speaking, would that be separate in terms of the analysis and data and everything that went into it, separate from the first two trilogy trials? Um, you know, Pierre, do you want to answer that? I, I think it would be considered part of the trilogy program. Yeah. Um, so it would be, in effect, a trilogy three, if you will. Um, the question is, and Pierre can jump in here, but um, you know, the question is how big that study would need to be, how long the study would need to take. You know, because we, we already, just in Trilogy 2 alone, have more patients than, for example, um, Ameren had with, with their um, marine trial. Uh, remember, they just had one trial to get approval in severe hypertriglyceridemia. Um, so, so, you know, the question is how big will that trial need to be and could it go for 12 weeks instead of 26 weeks? Um, Pierre, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, it's part of the, the story. So if we have Trilogy uh, 3, uh, it, it will be um, used as, as um, you know, all the trials, even our Phase 2 trials, will, will be part of the, the story. So you cannot just take a trial and, and, and hide it, you know. So it's, it's out there and it, they're going to be uh, looking at this. And um, so I, th I think, and, and on the efficacy as well, so not only uh, safety, but um, uh, not only efficacy, but safety as well will be combined. So definitely, but like Jan said, I think it's an important point. Um, we have the biggest program, and if we have Trilogy 3, it's going to be even bigger than the others. And those numbers now might be very, very useful for us. So, uh, and this is what uh, Jan was alluding uh, earlier. The fact that we have, uh, this is the biggest program, uh, if Trilogy 2 turned out to be positive, there's there's ways to, if you will, mitigate the impact of Trilogy 1. So that this is the magic of statistical uh, analyses. But, uh, uh, you know, we'll know more uh, in the future about this, but um, it, it's obvious that the, the, the more patients, the better. And it allows really to mitigate some of these, you know, uh, fluke or, you know, uh, bad luck that we've seen. 
So uh, I would imagine that if Trilogy 2 is have to be done, it will be, you'll need to confirm some of, of the doubts that FDA will have. So, um, and that's why those post-hoc analyses become important because you're, you, you can show, uh, prove to the FDA that if you, you know, if you're really m limiting your population to this, uh, that, that you have a, a very interesting outcome. And this is how you can define the future design of phase of the of, of Trilogy 3, if need be. So, yeah, so overall, everything will be taken together, for sure. Thank you. And if I could just ask one more question, after you guys reported all the secondary and exploratory endpoints from the two Trilogy 1 and Trilogy 2, um, if you see sort of a confirmation of the trifecta effect, and maybe do you think you could build in something to look more at a diabetic population in a future trial? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I caught what the question was, Nathan, but but um, we absolutely are looking at all of that in the secondary and exploratory endpoints. None of that has been unblinded yet. Um, so we'll look at all of that after we unblind Trilogy 2. Remember, it was really important to make sure we were clear on how the FDA wanted us to handle the Trilogy 1 data before we, you know, fully did the analysis on all the secondary and exploratory endpoints. Um, so, so, of course, that's really, really important because we believe that uh, Capri has uh, some unique um, advantages. And uh, we would hope to, you know, see what we saw in phase two, you know, that we have at least a neutral to uh, favorable effect on LDL, um, uh, neutral to positive effect, uh, increasing HDL. Uh, and then it's going to be very, very interesting, the fact that we had, you know, 50% of our patients were diabetics in Trilogy 1. We've got the population there to really look at what's going on with their hemoglobin A1C. Um, and uh, we, we don't know what the mix is yet in, in Trilogy 2, but, but uh, the, you know, we should have enough data there to really, you know, look at, at those key uh, lipid endpoints and, um, you know, be able to uh, uh, show, hopefully, some advantage with Capri. Thanks, Jan. I appreciate the caller. You bet. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes our question and answer session. We'll turn the floor back over to our speakers. Okay, well, um, I don't have much more to add. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening in today, uh, and we absolutely look forward to continuing to provide you with additional updates uh, as soon as we have them and as soon as possible. So uh, with that, I'd just say, you know, everyone uh, take care, stay safe, and we'll speak to you all soon. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's teleconference. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time, and have a great day. Thank you.